Hey, welcome back to the Backyard Professor Chess videos. Hey, I finally have a calm day. I'm able to get out in my backyard for a little bit. Hey, uh, this King's Indian defense I'm going to show you. Let's do another King's Indian defense. Uh, this is really one of the better chess openings for black to play. And you have a lot of options, but you have to... Here, here's the trick with chess openings. You can't spend 10 years of your life memorizing specific lines only. You have to understand some of the basic chess principles. If not, if someone deviates from the book, you're lost. You have to know what to do. You have to know how to read the board, right? So this particular game, what I want to do is, uh, in, in going through the chess openings, I'm trying to show you basic chess principles, as well as give you some idea on the ins and outs of the various openings. And that is important to do. This particular King's Indian was played by Viktor Korchnoi and Kasparov. Now, Kasparov, I don't know if he gets enough credit. Uh, he, he was the best. He, he just was. That's just all there is to it. Uh, Kasparov has black pieces here. Really schools Viktor Korchnoi on the King's Indian. Now, Korchnoi was a defector from the Soviet Union. You know, he came to the United States. And uh, so him and Kasparov kind of had a, a somewhat of a, a rivalry, I'll put it. And uh, th this, is, uh, this is one of the rivalry games where Korchnoi really disdains Kasparov and vice versa. What this, what this setup is doing here, now the main, the main theme of chess is the control of the center, not necessarily possession. But these four squares, the, the e4 and e5, and the d4 and d5 squares are really important. You can see that we're touching down here, and you can see that we're touching up here. The main idea here, the bishop g7 is aiming at the d4 square. And, and this is the square that, uh, that they're fighting for from a distance at this point. And e4 comes up here, and Kasparov pushes the d6. Now, it's a buildup of the pawns. They're going to try to put the pawns in the right place, and then they're going to build up their pieces around how to defend or possess the center. And Korchnoi is the first to actually take possession of the center with his pawns. This doesn't mean that the King's Indian defense is a weak opening, however. you got to understand, the influence from the distance is really quite strong. Him pushing up the d6 like this helps prevent the white player in the King's Indian defense from rolling over with the pawns, right? And this is the idea. And because of the nature of the opening, and this is true for most openings. I mean, I'm giving you a general principle here. The castling is pretty important, right? And of course, Korchnoi is going to prepare the castle too against a dangerous attacking player like Kasparov. You definitely do not want to keep your king in the center of the board, and Korchnoi does it. <clears throat> he castles. Castles early. You can see the pressure is on in the center, and this, again, the e5 thrust, it's a typical King Indian thrust. Of course, North Castles, and he's getting his knights out again, influencing the center. They're beginning to get their pieces together. Now, a common theme in the King's Indian defense, from this point of view, is when the c6 knight comes out, of course, the c6 knight is hitting the d4, and the e5 squares, right? And this knight is hitting the d4 and e5 squares, right? And we've got the pawns arguing about the d4 and e5 squares, right? And the fianchetto bishop here that is supporting the monarch is also streaking down this angle. So this is a pretty important fight for the center square, right? I just want to point that out. This is the idea, one of the many ideas, in the King's Indian defense. 
one way to lessen Black's influence on the D4, one reason why the white pieces want to have this central lineup of the pawns is because they can keep pushing it. Now, you can exchange pawns, but the idea is there's going to be pieces from a distance, from a safe distance, influencing these squares. So Korchnoi pushes the pawn forward, right? You see how he does that? What this, it, true, it closes the center. It locks those pawns. It takes away this knight on c6. Get rid of that knight that's influencing these two squares, which he does, so, so Kasparov brings his knight down here to e7. Now that's not a, uh, that's not a weakening move by any means. It's just a way that you can put the knight. It can still have influence up here in the center, but now it's influencing these squares here, while this knight is influencing these squares. So you can still see that it's a good setup. Now, knight e1, what Korchnoi is going to do is he's going to rearrange his knights. Now, you're saying, well, they're moving too many pieces too many times. Not true. Hold on. The center is locked. You can see that. The pawns are linked. So there's not going to be any traffic through the center of this chessboard. So when the center gets locked, you play on the wings. Either wing, whichever wing you think you're prepared to meet. So Korchnoi, by pushing his knight back down here, can bring it up to here either d3 or f3 and continue to dominate and influence the center. So they are in the process of rearranging their knights at this point, and that's exactly what Kasparov does with his next knight move. Now each of his knights have moved a couple times. Neither player is losing any time, though. Uh, you look at it and you say, well, I don't know who has the initiative. It's not clear if either one of them have the initiative right now. Now is the time to rearrange the board to get either wing play on the queen side or wing play on the king side. The Jeremy Silman rule in chess says, as a general rule, the direction that your pawns point is the side you're going to play on when the center is locked. And that makes perfectly logical sense. Here, Kasparov's pawns are pointing to the king side. He should be preparing for a king side. Korchnoi's pawns go either direction, to the king side or to the queen side. He does have more central space. Now that's an important imbalance to understand too. This extra space gives Korchnoi more room to manipulate his pieces to either side, to coordinate them better. You kind of get the feel that, that Kasparov is somewhat cramped because he is. And the center, and there's nothing wrong with playing in the center. In fact, that's the part of the board you really do want to play in. However, at this point, it's completely locked. So you see how the strategy is for the grandmasters on this uh, particular type of an opening. And then bishop comes up here to e3. Again taking that long a7 g1 diagonal that's always a really usually you'll see you'll see the bishop moves either to e3 or to d3 you'll see that a lot in the king's indian absolutely now i was just saying crossbar's points pawns are pointing to the king side right and quite frankly all of his pieces his his uh, main defender bishop is here giving support to his e5 pawn, but his knights can jump over here really quick. And his knights can jump over here really quick and then open up the lanes for the bishop and the queen. So realistically, one way to begin a kingside initiative, and it, timing is everything. You want speed. Uh, if you dawdle, you lose. <laughs> you want the speed, and now we see Kasparov doing that. Boom, F5 immediately. He's going to stake more claim, more territory on the king's side. Absolutely. He wants more space. He wants to lead out with a pawn or two so that they can be the battering rams, and then the pieces will back him up 
and he's going after the king. So this is really easy to see, isn't it? Now Kasparov has pretty much committed himself to the king's side with this F-pawn push. Korchnoi is going to meet him part way. He's going to give support to his E4 pawn here. He's not going to let Kasparov just blow out the center open yet because one reason Korchnoi hasn't really prepared any kind of a queen side thrust. He also, if you look at the board, hasn't really prepared any kind of a uh, a king side attack either. <clears throat> he for lack of a better way to describe it, he's more in the defensive mode at this point. Don't kid yourself, Korchnoi is a very powerful attacker. Rather than take the pawn and open things up and exchange the rooks and measure down just yet, trade down I should say, what Kasparov did was he pushed the pawn again. And you will see this quite often in King Indian defense games also. What this enables Black to do is continue expanding on, on the king's side, get more space so he can bring more pieces in, but it also allows white to dodge down his bishop. He doesn't necessarily lose that, and now he has a pretty solid defensive structure. So now here's where the creativity in chess comes in, and you can't find two more creative chess players to play through and enjoy the game with than Korchnoi and Kasparov, so this is a great game. Now he immediately follows up with g5, which is an eminently logical analysis. That, that's perfect. That's how to do it. So the game is on. Now, does Korchnoi... This is the opening shot. I'll put it that way. For now, Kasparov has said, okay, I want the king side. Here's my state claims. Korchnoi says, okay, I'm more or less ready for you. That's fine. However, I also am going to play hard in this game. So now Korchnoi begins operations on the queen side. You notice he's not continually just responding to what Kasparov does. Now, you can't just ignore your opponent all the time. you got to kind of judge when to ignore an opponent's threats, when to take it seriously. Korchnoi is going to continue on his own escapade. Knight g6 here. Here comes Kasparov on the king's side. Knight d3. Here comes Korchnoi up the center. Now, when you or your opponent is doing a wing attack, whatever wing it is, it doesn't matter which side, one of the best ways to refute them is center attack. Korchnoi, bringing up his knight here, gives himself a possibility to have a very strong central attack, which 99% of the time neutralizes the attack on the wings. In this instance, this is a kingside attack. Korchnoi, as the basic chess strategy says, is going to go right up the gut. Yeah, he's going to eviscerate him through the middle. This is the intention, right? And now knight f6. You can see now he's opened up the lane for his bishop. He's opening up the lane for his queen. He's got this pawn pushed as far as he can go, which gives him a partial open file for the rook, and then the rook can skip over on the h file and continue on with the kingside attack. This is a full-fledged kingside. Korchnoi, to prepare for this, very interestingly, starts with the queenside movement. This is the way to do this. If he were to exclusively respond and react only to Kasparov's argument on the king side, he would more or less likely lose. If he presents a counterattack, a counterargument on the queen side, and if he does it fast enough, then Kasparov is going to have to slow down on his fight and pay attention to the queen side because he's going to break through and destroy the queen side, possibly push a pawn and get a queen and win the game. Right? So this is classic chess struggle. This, this game can't be, there, there can't hardly be a better example of this struggle. Now what's Kasparov do? Kasparov is saying to Korchnoi, yes, I saw your pawn move over here. Pfft, it doesn't mean a thing to me. I am continuing my king side. You notice each one 
is attempting and striving to dictate the course of this chess game. That's where we want to get to where we can play like. Roy does have to pay attention somewhat. He's getting ready. Rook f7, here we go. Opening up the rook, he can bring the queen and the bishop over here and then bring his second rook in. He's going to commit his entire army to this kingside attack. Another thing to notice in the Grandmaster games that's very, very critical for us amateurs to see is it's not just a one piece. He didn't just flick his queen out here and start trying to attack pawns and then zippity doo dah over here and try to nab a rook and all that. No, it's a complete army coordination with pawns, pieces, everything. That, that, uh, that gives us excellence in chess. Korchnoi is telling Kasparov, yes, I know, I know you're coming on the king side, but I can get you on the queen side. So he's not ignoring him, but he's attempting to get a queen side going. It, because that's the only other place he can play. The center is locked. So he has to go to the queen side. Right? And he does so. Kasparov meets him there, shutting off his pawn storm, or attempting to. Korchnoi goes ahead and destroys the pawn structure. He says, I'm still going to attack you anyway. The bishop takes the pawn here. Now there's an open file here. There's a, there's a, a weakness, a backward pawn on c7. Uh, b7 is weak. So he's created weaknesses in Kasparov's queen side. Now when you create the weaknesses, then you attack those weaknesses. This is what Korchnoi is doing. Instead of fretting and freaking out over here on the king side, he is taking care of his queen side operations. That's basically how you have to do it to thwart your opponent, right? Now watch what he does here. Pow! He continues. You notice he's not... He's not freaking out over here. He's not trying to bring a bishop up here or push his pawns here to meet Kasparov. No. He is creating weaknesses on the side of the board he can play on, and he's trying to beat Kasparov to the punch. Now, bishop comes back here to c8. He's going to start hitting. There could be a bishop sacrifice or a knight sacrifice coming on. So Korchnoi has to hurry on the queen side if he's going to beat uh, Kasparov to the punch here. Again, he takes an A-pawn. He's opening up the file. Isn't that it? Yes, he's got the double pawns, but he's got the file open now. He's got places for his knights to come up and in. So here comes Korchnoi. So this is really interesting. He's not freaking out by Kasparov's attack. Kasparov gently, step by step, with every single piece in his army, including the pawns, is just systematically trying to make his pieces better. Because a proper kingside attack, especially against the astute Korchnoi, has to include everything. And you can just see this on the board, can't you? I mean, when you look at that chess setup, if you were to run across this chessboard position, in a book or on a table or whatever, and no one else was there, you would immediately begin to see Black is going for a kingside attack. You would see everything, everything is pointing. This rook has declared its intention to allow this rook to come over. The queen's going to get into this. The bishop's going to come down here somewhere. Everything is going to the kingside attack. You wouldn't have to be a chess expert to see that at all, would you? You would also see that white has been busy over here on the queen side. He's made some targets. He's got some weak squares here that he can, there's a good hole right here. He could put a knight on. He can dominate the queen side if he gets there. So that's the race. You can just virtually read the chessboard there, huh? And true to form. Watch what Korchnoi does. Knight b4. Here he comes on the queen side. Now, Kasparov. It appears to me that Kasparov is a little closer to getting his attack going sooner than Korchnoi is. Korchnoi is just uh, one step behind. <laughs> Darn it, no matter how hard he tries, he's just one step behind. Beautiful outpost with the knight c6. He is 
I think Korchnoi understood that he's behind, but does that cause him to quit trying? No. Look, he is still coming up the queen side. Now, Kasparov has to respond. <clears throat> Queen's in danger. This knight's coming up into here to fork the king and the bishop and potentially a rook or, or start eliminating the pawns. You see, this is the hole, and Korchnoi found that hole because he had created it by pushing his queenside pawns, right? So now he's using the imbalance, the weakness that he created in Kasparov's camp to go get Kasparov. This is excellent chess. I mean, <laughs> it almost can't get better than this, man. This is as good as it gets. Queen dodges over to f8, out of danger, so to speak. And now the f-pawn does take the g-pawn. f-pawn takes the king-pawn, uh, the g-pawn, I should say, and now weaknesses begin to appear on the king side of Korchnoi. And h takes g4. That's proper. Here comes the attack. We're on a full-scale swing. H takes g4. It appears that Korchnoi, because of the way he set up his pawns, Korchnoi has defended this really well so far. Even though, yes, that's true, there's weaknesses. You notice how each player is striving to create weaknesses in the other player's side? And now, of course... Oh, whoops, not that one. This one. Bishop g5. Steadily marching forward. It's a king's eye attack, but it's not a blazing, blistering sacrifice a queen, two rooks, and three of your bishops to get to the king. It's a steady, systematic buildup. Man, that's powerful chess. <laughs> that, that just makes it solid. It, this is an excellent game illustrating how to do this properly, right? Now bishop comes to f3. Uh, Korch noise in the pickle. He has to blunt this attack. And now, of course, queen to h6. <laughs> Just piece by piece. Bishop from here to there. Bishop from there to there. And now the queen from here moving over and coming in. Yes, Korchnoi got a threat on the queen by trying to get the queen side, right? But now the queen has moved into such a powerful king side attack position that it virtually nullifies Korchnoi's queen side attack. That's one very excellent way to nullify your opponent's threats, is make stronger threats of your own. Man, this is a Beautiful game to show this. Korchnoi goes rook e1. We're going to try like crazy to, to keep things on the par. Here we go. Systematically, queen, bishop, knight. Now the knight comes to h4. He's just coming down systematically, step by step, against Korchnoi. And there's not a lot Korchnoi can do to stop this. One strategy you can do when someone is attacking either of your wings, it doesn't matter if it's the king side, it doesn't matter if it's the queen side, you can begin exchanging pieces. Because if you exchange the pieces, they have less units to attack you with. Right? That's just basic chess thinking, right? So Korchnoi starts eliminating the pieces of Kasparov. He's going to eliminate the attackers. In the process, you do eliminate your defenders. So this is why whoever races to one side or the other, you've got to have as many of your pieces on that side to defend or to attack. So the question is, who gets the most power on the wings? Who wins this game here? It's coming down now. Let's see. Korchnoi goes to g5. Queen takes g5. Now you say, he just gave him a pawn. Well, yes and no.
what he's doing is he's trying to give himself space so that he can coordinate bringing in more of his pieces. Sometimes your pawns can be in the way. you got to push them to get them out of the way. Unfortunately, because of the nature of Kosparov bringing his queen over here and putting her down on h6, she's in a stronger position now than she was. Right? But that's just the nature of this particular setup because Kosparov has a better prepared setup. Rook starts guarding the pawn in front of the king, but of course. See, he's got some defending pieces here. He's trying his very golly gosh darndest. And now, boom, he's got the knight to come in. Now, and you say, well, putting the knight here puts him in danger. That's true. He'll probably realistically exchange the knight, but that puts the queen on this square one step closer, and now it gives his rook and his bishop coordination here. So it looks to me like Kasparov is going to get this one. It truly does. Rook comes to b1. At this point, that's almost a concession. You've got me. He's going to attempt one last time to maybe come up into here. I don't know how he's going to do it to get to the king, but his queen side has fizzled. Unfortunately, there's not, you notice by, by coming down with his pawn chain like this and putting, amassing his pieces here, uh, he's cramped Korchnoi. And it's hard to bring your piece. See, Korchnoi's two minor pieces are completely out of the defense, and he really needs them over here. His, his rooks aren't really coordinated that well, they don't have access over here to threaten the queen, so to speak. This pawn can't just start jumping up. It's got to protect the king now. So it, it just doesn't look good for uh, Doc on it. It doesn't look good. And step by step, Kosparov comes closer. He cramps Korchnoi even more. And that prevents Korchnoi because of the lack of space it prevents him from bringing his pieces over and coordinating. The bishop can't move hardly except take the knight, and that just gives the queen a stronger space. The knights can't get over here anywhere. They virtually can't move. I mean, you could take that piece, but what's the point? He'll just lose a knight. So, so this is looking ugly for, for uh, Korchnoi. Queen does manage to come up to d3, however... And now Kasparov puts the queen at h4. You notice this, and here is where Korchnoi resigned. And I, I mean, I think the reason's obvious. He, he just, he is not going to win. There is too much power here. He's got the, uh, he's got the queen to here. It virtually can't be prevented. And then you chase the king over and, and checkmate him. So in, in, just baby steps. Now this was a powerful kingside attack. Was there any flashing lightning bolts out of the blue? Was there any superb, outrageous, wild sacrifices? No. There really wasn't. I, it, and it's always fun to see those kind of games, yes, and they do exist. And if you have an opportunity to play a chess game like that, by all means, throw the queen out there and sacrifice her if it gets your knight or bishop or rook to a more effective square to get the king, yes. Otherwise, you're just showing off and throwing material away and losing the game, and, and that's a problem I have. I like the flashy sacrifice, the wild, extravagant moves, and so on and so forth. In this game, Kasparov showed us that a systematic small steps, just one move here, one move there, one move here, one more move there, a gentle, slow increasing of the pressure, slowly cramping down Korchnoi, systematically putting your pieces in better places wins the game. So there's your chesticide for the day. Have fun, do well, be good, don't stay up too late, unless you're like me and you like the late nights. But then on the other hand, you miss the beautiful sunrises. So, boy, there's just one thing after another, isn't there? Be good, man. And I will see you in the next chess video.
Most definitely.